this is the fourth advanced pediatric endocrine symposium which we are organizing the first one in the form was actually started off in 2017 and since then many of the faculty all the guiders everybody is the same and we are continuing with the same theme for a quite a long time it's been really a pleasure in that regards now when we had actually we were always thinking that pediatric endocrinology is a rare group of disorders which are complicated, which are cumbersome in terms of workup and very expensive treatment. So people used to, in a way, shrug away from pediatric endocrinology, don't want to go into this field and everybody was very scared, so to speak, about that. Now, when we thought about this, what we realized is that there are three issues in any health problem, awareness, accessibility, and affordability. Now, everybody says these are not affordable, but we believe that awareness actually is the elephant in the house. And if we increase the awareness amongst the general public, amongst the physicians, we would be able to improvise the care. And this was the motto by which we established the pediatric endocrine uh, group. And then we started the growth society working in that direction. Now, if you look at the pediatric endocrinology burden in India and the specialists who are available, what we see is that we would probably have a handful, maybe 100 will be the overall, maybe an overestimation also at the moment, but now with more fellows, the numbers will increase. So this is still is a very, very uh, small number for the burden of population for type 1 diabetes, growth hormone, thyroid, all those things. And pediatricians are approximately in much bigger number. So we need to really have a bridge in which things can improvise and connect between the two so that we can have a continual good quality care in everywhere. So currently, pediatric endocrinology is focused and centered in few cities. Some cities like Bangalore will have maybe 20 people who are there. But then some whole states will not have people who are trained at all. So we need to have more wider exposure. And that's why it's very important on part of everybody. And it's responsibility of us pediatric endocrinologists. And ISPE has been working a lot in that to really spread the message of pediatric endocrinology. We have been doing a lot of programs right from 2011. And you can see many of the same people have been involved and they have always been our inspirational force there. We started with our first program in 2011. And then since then, there have been hundreds of programs which were run in terms of workshops, in terms of advanced courses, practical courses across the country, which we have been conducting. Now, this basically is the third advanced pediatric endocrinology symposium. And from there, what we realize that if we keep on doing workshops, how much time can we spend? Like it's not possible to do workshop everywhere. So we started off with social media in terms of YouTube platforms. And from there, a large number of people actually were able to access and you don't need to be there all the time. They can access that. Then we started an on-site fellowship program and we've got Chetan from the first batch, Neha from the second batch today, who are there. We until now had 11 fellows who are being under part of training. Then what we realized is that if you want to have a structured training, we need to have a web-based program. So we started with a MediClasses uh, platform, which provides a lot of information, started with books, and then to practically use that knowledge, mobile applications were developed. So we have got a lot of e-learning videos available on YouTube with huge number of views. This is something which is available covering entirety of pediatric endocrinology. We have got structured learning program under our learning.growsociety.in. We also offer a two-year hybrid program for fellowship and a one-year hybrid for diploma. We had got a lot of people who come to us every six months for a week. They learn the exam. So it's a very intense process. So we are going to have some of the announcements about the results of the fellowship program, the first one. We conduct a lot of online courses, pretty much three to four every month. So it's quite intense. We have got a number of publications which are there. And what we are going to launch today is the second edition of our Pediatric Endocrinology Protocols, which is a completely updated book about latest protocols for pediatricians, pediatric endocrinologists, endocrinologists, and we'll be releasing this today. One major advantage we wanted to take was with regards to our application, because that will provide much easy access to use, because what you learn, if you don't use it immediately, you will forget and the errors will come in. And these applications were developed and they are now become the most popular endocrinology application across the globe. And we have done a lot of publications regarding the growth interpreter, which allows practical interpretation of growth. We have got the obesity interpreter, which has been validated. We have got puberty interpreter, which allows interpretation of puberty for thyroid, for DSD, and all of them have been presented and they are in publication in different places in that regards. 
Now, what we have done now is a very interesting thing, which is actually a combination of all that we have done. This is a bone age assisted interpretation of growth. So all the pediatrician would have to do is to put some basic data. It includes information like birth weight, sitting height. So all the rough things that we anyway write down and we measure, we just write the Tanner staging, we match it. We have the bone age interpretation. And as soon as this is done, it is using all the algorithms which are available. And based upon this algorithm, we will have a lot of information, data points will be available. So you will have specific charts, bone age interpretation, a lot of parameters. And this will predict the likely diagnosis, most likely investigation. And we are validating this now. So this will be a very valuable tool for screening pediatric endocrine disorders. And hopefully, so this is how the result will look like. So you will have charts. And you will have table which has got a lot of interpretation and then we'll give you the final interpretation as to what is the likely diagnosis in that regards. We are coming up also with a personalized intelligent EMR which is going to basically decide based upon specific conditions, give the inputs for every condition and once you choose those conditions, you get the data, you will get an output which will guide in terms of evaluation, assessment, so only those which are relevant will come up on that drop-down menu. And based upon that, you will have a state-of-the-art evidence-based algorithm-driven approach which will come and analysis will come. This will provide information in the form of also a nutrition chart. So a seven-day meal plan will be there. Most of our endocrine scenarios, we need radiological diagnosis to confirm and give the final diagnosis for our child. Today with us, we are... Extremely privileged to have Dr. Saket Nagam, Senior Radiologist at Regency Hospital. Now, we know the uh, common imaging modalities that we use in endocrine setup are the ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Of course, we will not be discussing X-ray today. Um, so, let us start with... Uh, sir, please. Yes, sir. So, we will start off with ultrasound. Uh, so, could you explain the... Uh, principle that ultrasound is based on ultrasound is we have to go into the principles also it's okay. like the basic you send the sound waves it comes back like it's a practically taken from the sonar what you submarines use if they send the signal they receive the signal and interpret the image on the basis of the sound waves yeah. Yeah, that's it in the short. So the advantages with ultrasound are that it is simple and cheap, no radiation exposure, and many angles and sections can be taken with an ultrasound. The major disadvantages with ultrasound is that expertise is required. And in older children, once the anterior fontanel is closed, no brain imaging is possible. So, sir, what uh, common endocrine organs can we use in ultrasound for? The adrenal is one of them. Yes, sir. Thyroid is another one. Yes. Easily accessible. And the... Ovaries. Ovaries. Yes, thank you so much. Moving on to the CT scan. Uh, again, sir, could you in brief tell us? CT is an X-ray which rotates around the patient. The X-ray tube rotates around the patient. It gives a three-dimensional view. You have X-ray source at one place. You see in the upper part. And on the all other sides are detectors. And the whole gantry moves in this way. The, the tube moves. The clockwise direction and the same the detectors move. It takes the images out of it. So yes, it is a, it is giving a 360 degree X-ray view of a given organ. Again, the advantages with CT are that it is a quick modality. It has lower cost than an MRI and uh, gives excellent bone visualization. Disadvantages are higher radiation exposure, poor soft tissue contrast, and the fact that it is non-portable, although we know that portable CT scans are also now being up available. The common uh, structure that one would see, endocrine structures on CT, uh, sir? Cella, okay. Cella is one of them. Adrenals, okay. Pancreas, I would like to specially mention the part pancreas. Pancreas is best visualized on CTs. Cella, MRI can do the work. Adrenals, even ultrasound or MRI, I would say MRI is slightly superior, my personal view. Pancreas, CT is the choice of investigation. Thank you, sir. Moving on. Uh, so, a principle of MRI in brief. MRI principle. Okay. It is like uh, you take the magnetic waves, you, they are bombard them on a, boy, some, uh, on a human body, and it's basic of the hydrogen atoms get aligned because of the magnetic waves. 
as they return back to their normal position, the images are taken. This is the shortest one I can say. One is the word like resonance. Your, you can take it in a different way. Your bo body's own magnetism and the machine's magnetism. A resonance is made between them. When they do collide, a resonance appears, which is taken away, which forms the image. Yeah. So again, the advantages with MRI is that it allows excellent soft tissue visualization. It has no radiation exposure and it is one of the mostly used um, investigation for endocrine gland visualization. The disadvantage is that it takes time in pediatric setting. It may require sedation. Um, and again, for children with pacemakers and metals or patients with pacemakers and metals, it is it cannot be done. Uh uh, MRI, com MRI compatible pacemakers are available nowadays and most of the MRI pacemakers being used nowadays are MRI compatible. So again, so the images, the organs where one would prefer an MRI in... Brain is one of them. Yeah, yeah. it's good. In the pediatrics, in the endocrine setting, a PQT gene added. Okay, so we'll start off with imaging in pediatric endocrinology, the pituitary the images. So... Uh, we'll start off with the anatomy, sir. T1, T2, two basic sequences. How do I differentiate? T1, can you give me the pointer once? I'll just show you this top before starting for the MRI. I would like to say, which one is it? No, top one. It's. Okay. Okay. So, even CSF is hypo intense. Will I move the cursor here? So no. All you see around this is the third ventricle. All you can see the CSF spaces here. The whole the black things you are seeing. T1 is CSF with black, T2 is CSF bright. Whenever you see something which is bright on T1, the T1 image here, what are the things which can appear T1 bright? The first and foremost thing which you can see is there are only a few things which are bright on T1. T2, everything is bright. Almost everything is bright on T2. T1 bright are blood. The first. The second is fat. I won't be able to show fat here. The blood, fat, melanin and the posterior pituitary. These are the only four things. Just remember the point. Next is gadolinium, sometimes inspicited secretions. Everything is rare. The commonest three things are you have blood, uh, fat and melanin. So when you see a teratoma, you see fat there, T1 bright. It gives you a diagnosis. You see a mass lesion with a T1 bright signal. What can it be? It can be an apoplexy or it can be a lipoma. You have to differentiate between the two only. And third thing is melanoma. Take Okay. So, sir, uh, discussing the anatomy on uh, a societal section. So, what? You have already mentioned everything. Okay. <laughs> can I? Pointer is not working. No, that yes. the problem. Explaining everything. So, um, yeah. So that uh, we see the hypothalamus, the chiasm, the structures you look at in uh, on an MRI hypothalamus pituitary is identify the hypothalamus, the chiasm, and then you go back, go down and in the cellar tercica, you'll find the anterior pituitary and behind which you see the posterior right spot. What the you see, see, wherever the you have seen a hypothalamus written, what you see anteriorly where the chiasm is written, chiasm. You go along. I'll just talk on the pointer. Yes, in the um, coronal section, again, um, as can be matched with the uh, adjacent uh, picture, we see the optic chiasm as the horizontal uh, disc-like uh, structure. The thin stalk is what comes uh, down from there and the uh, lower structure is the anterior pituitary with a concave upper surface here. CT uh, of pituitary is an excellent modality. Can we have something to point? Because it becomes difficult.
laptop also we are not able to do it. You don't show there, yeah. Just pointing out it's. Pointer maybe not there. Okay, Okay, so this is the hypothalamus pituitary in the coronal section, sir. I'll go there. Yes. This is the pituitary. Sometimes when there is a microadenoma, how do you diagnose in a non-contrast scan? What happens is you see a bulge on one side. The contour gets bulge up. So whenever you see a severe pituitary, look into the bilateral contours. If there is a bulge on one side, a possibility of pituitary microadenoma remains. Okay. Oh. That's the important point in this one. Oh. And the stock deviation can be seen on the coronal images. On either side, there are carotids and these are the cavernous spaces. These are the cavernous spaces, cavernous sinuses, and this is the internal carotid. Any paracellular mass, if it infiltrates into the cavernous sinuses, coronal section is the best section for it. Okay. Uh, CT, as sir has mentioned, is an excellent modality to look at, look for bony involvement. So, sir, uh, what bony? There is a mass lesion. If you see there, this is whole. Uh, this complete is a mass lesion in the cella, which is extending up to the cell, supracellular region. It's causing in the uh, diaphragm cell, this is a breakdown and destruction of the sphenoid, sphenoid sinus. Again, as I said, uh, an acute hemorrhage may be visualized on... Uh, acute, acute hemorrhage, this is on CT. Yes. CT, blood is bright. Calcification is bright. How do we measure calcifications? Blood, how do we differentiate on CT? It is on the attenuation value. A blood has an attenuation value of something around 50 to 60. The attenuation value ranges from minus 1000 to plus 1000. Minus 1000 is air. Plus 1000 is calcification or bony calcification. So the, everything ranges between it. What else you find negative is fat. There are only two things you find negative, air and fat. Fat ranges something between minus 100. And the blood, you can see it's less darker. It has a household unit of 54, 50 to 70. And this is something around 100 to 200. It's more brighter. So what are the key features that one will want to see in an MRI hypothalamus? What should we look at? One of the posterior, posterior pituitary. Yes, sir. Posterior pituitary is always bright on T1 weighted imaging, T1 MRI, because of the polypeptides of esopressin, I think. Yes. Yeah. And the size of the uh, size of the anterior pituitary, the sphenoid sinuses, the infundibular stalk, optic chiasm, these are the main things which I have to look at. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the cases now. We have a five-year-old girl with precocious puberty with Tanner stage two. Her height is significantly advanced and uh, bone age is at nine years. We find that the LHFSH levels are in the pubertal range, suggesting a, a gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty. So uh, we went ahead with neuroimaging in this child. And uh, this is what we see. So could you describe this image for us, sir? I'm not able to see it. Okay. So this is the optic chiasm of this part. Posterior, this area is known as the posterior to it. The area is known as tuber cinerium. The only common tumor you see in tuber cinerium is a hematoma. I don't know of any other malignancy coming out at that place. That is the only tumor in the region of tumor, uh, tuber cinerium. So this was an hypothalamic hematoma. Moving on to the next case. Uh, we have a 27-year-old boy with growth failure, significantly compromised height and a pubertal staging of uh, uh, testicular volume of 2 ml and pubic hair stage 1. FT4 was low in the presence of a normal TSH, suggesting that this was central hypothyroidism. When uh, growth hormone stimulation test was done, the peak levels were 0.2, again suggesting growth hormone deficiency and undetectable LH levels. So this was a clear-cut 
clinical picture of MPHD. We went ahead with neuroimaging, and this is what we find. Um, Can anybody locate the pituitary? Empty cell. Okay. Yes. The cell is filled up with CSF. Yes. And uh, the one posterior to it is the bright spot of posterior pituitary in this one, sir? Yeah. Okay. Moving on, we have a 12-year-old boy with polyuria for one year. Initial screening tests were normal. Uh, he had a sodium of 138 and a urine osmolality of 71, suggesting that his plasma osmolality must have been around 270 to 80. So a concentrated blood, a dilute urine, we went ahead with AVP response test, which was positive. So we knew this was central DI. Now we need to know the cause in central DI. And imaging, neuroimaging was done. And I'm sorry, we don't have the right image here. <clears throat> Um, but a posterior, absent posterior pituitary bright spot was uh, identified. So I want to know, sir, what, uh, do we use a T1 or T2 uh, image to identify? T1. 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 And I said, no, T1, what are the things bright on T1? Yes. T2, many things are bright. So don't judge on the basis of T2. And do we need to use a contrast image or a non-contrast non image? Non-contrast image for posterior. Moving on, we have a five-year-old boy with polyuria and weight loss, had normal screening tests. Again, uh, we see a concentrated blood and a dilute urine, positive AVP response test suggesting central DI. We went ahead with neuroimaging and this is what we find. You have mass in the pineal region. And in the pituitary stalk. Another in the pituitary stalk, yeah. What is it? I, mean, I don't know <laughs> the two regions, so, two mass uh, regions. For germinoma, what I said was you didn't have a plain scan. What we had was a contrast scan. You should have had a plain scan. Plain scan have, would have showed you calcification. Because of the gadolinium, the enhancement is there. Now you can't differentiate between the, the fat, fatty layers and the gadolinium enhancement. A plain image would have been more characteristic of it. No, this is a contrast image. Uh, so, as we know, for a hypothalamic involvement to cause DI, we would need a very large image. However, if even a small lesion in the pituitary stalk can cause a uh, central DI-like picture. So, the criteria for uh, pitu pituitary stalk thickening are um, uh, width of more than 3.5 millimeters at origin, width of more than 2 millimeters at insertion, and um, pituitary stalk wider than the basilar artery. Common causes in pediatric endocrinology are uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, autoimmune hypophysitis, sarcoidosis, and germinoma, which may cause pituitary stalk thickening. Moving on to the next case, we have a six-year-old boy with short stature, severely compromised height of 100 centimeters, had normal screening investigations, and a peak growth hormone level of 1.2 nanogram per ml. So low growth hormone, low cortisol, we made a diagnosis of MPHT and went ahead with neuroimaging. So, so this was the image that we got. We are not able to locate the infundibular stalk, no? 16-year-old girl with delayed puberty, a compromised height of 144 centimeters, low LHFSH levels and low estrogen levels. Prolactin was 32 and cortisol was again low. So a borderline high prolactin. And this was what we got in neuroimaging. So this was again an MPHD with a slightly elevated prolactin. So this was the picture. What is it? It's a T2 image. T2. T2 fluid is bright. You find a lesion within the, within the cella which is bright on T2 suggesting a cystic lesion. The commonest cystic lesion there is that case cleft cyst. Moving on, we have a 14 year old boy with headache, had no focal deficit. MRI showed a mass lesion with prolactin of 80. To investigate for the cause, we went ahead with neuroimaging, and this is what we find. Now, so how do we identify if it is a, a supracellar mass coming down or a cellar mass that is going up radiologically? Whenever you have a cellar mass, if you have a cellar mass here, which extends superiorly, it will first widen the cella 
causes breakdown and then extends superiorly wherever the bulk of tumor is there. Here the bulk of tumor is superiorly. So the mass has to be from the super, uh, supracellar region extending downwards. So clinically, uh, if you look at it clinically, diabetes insipidus is absent in cellar mass and uh, usually early manifestation in supracellar mass. Hypopituitarism is earlier in cellar mass and a late presentation in supracellar mass when it has come down and is causing uh, compromised anterior pituitary function. Prolactin is usually low in a cellar mass unless it is a primary prolactinoma and it is high in uh, supracellar mass where your uh, dopamine uh, causing negative feedback on prolactin is impaired. Rim of pituitary tissue is absent in a cellar mass and is usually preserved in supracellar mass. And again, chiasmal involvement is early in a cellar mass that is progressing upward and is late in supracellar mass. Moving on, we have an 18-year-old boy with headache, had visual field complaint and very high prolactin of 14 nanograms per ml, uh, growth hormone deficiency and a central hypothyroidism. This is the uh, image that we got. So, sir, uh, could you describe where the... When I said, is here? this is the coronal image, these are the carotids, these are the cavernous sinuses. The mass lesion in the cella with supracellar extension and also cellular extension involving bilateral cavernous sinuses. Yes, yeah, so um, cellular Those, mass... Oh. Cellar mass extending upward, causing impingement of the optic chiasm, causing visual field defect, and also involving the supracellar area. This was definitely a prolactinoma. Moving on, we have this very interesting case. 18-year-old girl with headache presented to a neurologist with complaint of persistent headache for the last one year. On examination, she was found to have this DTS and was advised neuroimaging. Now, this is what we found on uh, the image. Yes. Uh, so what was interesting was that this uh, image was labeled as a pituitary adenoma and uh, being a pituitary adenoma, she was referred to an endocrinologist for further workup. Now, uh, we found that clinically she was short stature. She had short stature, had menarche at 12 years of age, but had irregular menses since then. Clinically, she had no goiter, but we had a strong clinical suspicion of hypothyroidism in this case. We went ahead with... Uh, blood investigation and what we found was low FT4 and a very high TSH. So this is again to bring to your attention that when uh, you have a child with a uh, patient, especially who's come, coming to you with a diagnosis of pituitary adenoma, test for your uh, thyroid function test because there may be a pituitary hyperplasia in the setting of primary hypo hypothyroidism. Okay. Uh, next, we have a 26-year-old female with secondary amenorrhea, had headache, visual complaints. Recent on, had, she had also developed recent onset polyuria, passing about 7 to 8 liters per day. We went ahead with neuroimaging, and this is what we find. So, uh, so could you describe this image for us? This is a contrast CT. What I can see it is with a heterogeneous mass lesion in the cella. The cella has widened, which is extending, which is extending superiorly, and also there is a cystic component in it. Is it and, a craniofrangioma or what is it? Yes, sir. So Second. she was a craniofrangioma. Oh. She also has calcification. Yeah, we could have taken a plain section. This one, again, a contrast one. Okay. Whenever being a radiologist, we see all the images. I'm used to all the images. What we are seeing is one image. Then again, it's a contrast image. So differentiating different characteristics would be difficult. Moving on, we have a seven and a half year old boy with precocious puberty who was also had a headache. <clears throat> uh, workup showed a gonadotropin. Calcification is best seen on CT scan. Craniopharyngioma has calcification. So it is best seen on CT scan. The best analysis you can do of a craniopharyngioma is on CT scan. <clears throat> So this was a uh, workup showed a gonadotropin-dependent precocious puberty. We went ahead with neuroimaging, and this is what we find, sir. So, oh, is it within the parenchyma or outside the parenchyma? How do you say within the parenchyma? CT you can get confused. MRI we don't get confused because when you see sulci like this, means it is outside. If it would have been inside, it would have obliterated the sulci because of the mass effect. So it is something outside the brain, parenchyma. 
So it's an extra axial mass, which is cystic in nature, cystic because it is having a blood component, fluid component. Now, extra axial mass lesions within the brain are of this nature are arachnoid cyst or an epidermoid cyst. There are two differentials for it. And how do we differentiate between the two? This is a diffusion weighted imaging. Diffusion weighted imaging, this is T2 imaging. We have to look into a diffusion weighted imaging. On diffusion weighted imaging, arachnoid cyst will appear as black and epidermoid would appear as bright. So that is one sequence which we have to look after it to differentiate between arachnoid and a epidermoid. Thank you. And the mass effect is still there. You can look into it. It has caused this is phenyl. The orbital orbital margin has been displaced because of the mass lesion. Thank you, sir. So we know that management for arachnoid cyst is again supportive. Uh, moving on to adrenal imaging, sir, uh, would you describe uh, USG? The super uh, second image, if you look into it, the small gland above the upper pole of kidney between the liver and the kidney is the adrenal. And that's a coronal scan with between the IVC and the kidney. You can see a coronal, I mean, axial scan between the IVC and the kidney. You can see the suprarenal, the two limbs and the body. So it is classically visualized as the Y-shaped uh, structure that you see here. Um, discussing the adrenal anatomy in CP. Bilateral adrenals. How do you say adrenal is bulky or not bulky? The best thing is you have the adrenals here. These are the two limbs. How do you say these are bulky or not bulky? Just look into the diaphragm. If it is thicker than the diaphragm, it is bulky. If it is not thicker than the diaphragm, it is normal. And again on adrenals, it will be again. Yeah, same thing. Same uh, suprarenal same. position. That, that's where you'll be able to identify it in the same structure. So moving on to the case again, we have a seven-year-old boy with early puberty, had SPL of seven centimeter, but TV was too 2cc, had again hypertension. So we were thinking of an adrenal pathology, a, a, a peripheral precocious puberty, and we wanted to rule out an adrenal pathology. LHFS, which were suppressed, again, supporting that this was a peripheral precocious puberty, and uh, testosterone level was high. His electrolytes were normal, 17 OHP was 20 nanograms per ml, and DOC was very high, 400 nanograms. This is the... Um, Ultrasound of the adrenal. Let bulky see. adrenals. The size of the adrenals, you look, it's bulky. Yes. So the, this was a uh, CAH case, congenital adrenal hypoplasia, presenting as precocious puberty. Two-week-old child with birth weight of 3 kgs was doing well earlier, has now suddenly come up with shock and hematuria. Exa clinical examination shows a flank mass. How do we radiologically differentiate between... Uh, a renal vein thrombosis versus an adrenal hemorrhage, sir. Can I have an image? This is simply a bulky hemorrhage. Radiologically, in general, in your clinical practice, I mean, in your practice, uh, is but it easy to differentiate between? No, I don't say it's easier. But when you have a hemorrhage, you have some amount of bright echoes, which you can see posteriorly where the arrow is, it's brighter. So there is some amount of blood here and it's not easy. And if you were to uh, go for an imaging, would you uh, uh, I'll go for a CT. One. CT. Okay, sir. Moving on, we have a seven-year-old boy with peripheral precocious puberty, undetectable LHFSH levels, very high testosterone levels, low 17 OHP in HCG levels. So, um, this is the image uh, that we find here. So, what large is large adrenal mass which has displaced the kidney? The kidney lies anteriorly, the spleen has been displaced, a large mass. And, um, so, was it malignant? Yes, sir. So, this adrenal came out mass, if it is larger than four centimeters, there are high possibility it turn, turning out to be a malignancy, except for myelolipoma. Except myelolipoma, all other 
adrenal masses if larger than 4 cm should be considered malignant otherwise proof so as sir has mentioned if you have a adrenal mass with regular margins less than 10 uh, hounsfield units a homogeneous structure early washout and uh, a smaller size especially one will think of an adenoma whereas if you have a mass larger than 4 cm that is a denser more than 20 hounsfield units heterogeneous and then one would think of a carcinoma Moving on to the next case, we had a 16-year-old girl who had severe abdominal pain and constipation, had normal blood pressure and electrolytes, cortisol level was 170 nanomoles per liter. Uh, for this uh, pain in abdomen, she went in an MRI and uh, was found to have an adrenal tumor for which she was referred to endocrine clinic. So, so what is this tumor specification that you see here? Exactly, the left kidney is displaced inferiorly, and there is a mass lesion if you can see, which is bright on T two. These are all T two images. You can see the calluses, the ureter coming out bright. So the fluid is bright. What else do you find bright on T one? If you have taken T one, it would have been bright. You see a large mass here, which has displaced the kidney. A bright mass here. This is a fat-containing myelolipoma. Uh, moving on, we have fifteen-year-old female with resistant hypertension, not controlled in three classes of drugs, had normal uh, plasma renin activity and electrolytes, and increased plasma metanephrins. <clears throat> so, sir, if you're thinking of a diagnosis of uh, um, <clears throat> pyochromocytoma, uh, what what is prefer preferred, CT or an MRI? Both of them do, or uh, intensely enhancing mass. Pyochromocytoma. Uh, so, could you describe uh, pyochromocytoma on different images? How it you can see a mass region on CT scan, which is indenting over the kidneys. On T1 imaging, they are uh, they are hypo intense, which I think they are dark. Most of the tumors, most of the things are dark on T1 imaging, except a few which I mentioned. T2 imaging, it appears at bright. Contrast enhancement, it shows heterogeneous contrast enhancement. Okay, that's all. Uh, last on, we have thyroid imaging. So, uh, sir, could you describe uh, the ultrasound? You, what you see in ultrasound is a homogeneous structures, symmetrical on both the sides with the right and left lobe, almost equally, equal in size and equal in signal characteristics. So one of the things which has to be kept in mind is the vascularity. Whenever you do an ultrasound of a thyroid, the vascularity has to be checked. If there is an increase in the vascularity, it's either a Graves' disease or a thyrotoxicosis. The rest of them think you're looking to look for an adenoma. That's it. Okay. Moving on to the first case, we have a 60 year old boy with uh, who's who had a very high TSH on newborn screening. Day seven TSH was 100 with a low FT4. An ultrasound was done. So, so what uh, is this? What do we see here? Are you able to see a thyroid here? Oh, so okay. <laughs> so yes, uh, this was labeled as a thyroid agenesis, confirmed on nuclear scan, which showed no uptake. And so we know this child will require lifelong thyroxine replacement here. Three-year-old girl, difficulty in swallowing on examination at a mass at base of tongue. TSH, the thyroid profile was normal. Uh, when we went ahead with the ultrasound, again, as the previous image, we saw no thyroid gland. We went for a nuclear scan, which showed an ectopic uh, thyroid tissue. And the, this was a case of lingual thyroid. Seven days old female with history of, um, seven day old baby with history of maternal hypothyroidism had a very high TSH on uh, newborn screening. Uh, repeat TSH was again high with low FT4 suggesting um, a congenital hypothyroidism. Now we want to know if this is transient or will persist. So we went ahead with uh, ultrasound. You see a uh, nodule on the left side of the thyroid. There is a nodule out there. Yeah. So the thyroid gland was visualized uh, in the right position. Nuclear scan showed no uptake. And the anti-TPO levels were high. So this was basically a transient uh, hyper congenital hypothyroidism, secondary to maternal TSH uh, receptor blocking antibodies. 12-year-old girl with neck swelling had clinically a soft goiter, normal uh, thyroid 
function. We went ahead with ultrasound neck, and this is what we see. An anechoic structure. It's a fluid containing cyst. The colloid goita. 18-year-old girl with classical symptoms of thyrotoxicosis had right uh, nodular goiter on examination. Very high FT4 with a suppressed TSH. And this is the picture that we see here. We wanted to know if this was uh, Graves versus a thyrotoxic nodule. Uh, this looks like more of a thyrotoxic nodule, this one. Again, a 25-year-old girl, a lady with the goiter, had lethargy and polymenorrhea, low FT4, high TSH, and this is the picture that we uh, got on ultrasound. A heterogeneous appearance. It's not that smooth appearing. And if you put a vascularity, it will be intensely vascular. This was thyrotoxicosis? This was thyroiditis. Thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. Thyroiditis. 12 year, this is the, uh, moving on to the next case. We have a 12 year old boy who had come with neck swelling. He had diffuse goiter with a bosselated surface on palpation. An ultrasound was done, and this is the image that we see bilateral thyroid nodules with small specks of dried specks. Was it colloid? So, because you have multiple specks on it. So we had gone with an FNAC, which was suggestive okay. of a So it was the other thing was. A papillary calcifications, which you see in CA yeah. uh, papillary, papillary carcinomas. Yeah. So, yes, this Tiny was of calcifications. Yes, so we are at the end of our session. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us here today. So, I'll take some inputs from the chairperson, Dr. Vikrant, first. Dr. Arpita? I would agree it was an enriching session, especially these images are very confusing as far as the physicians are concerned. Thank you so much, sir. So I think the key messages that you would like to give Dr. Sake to the endocrine perspective, I think mainly they discuss about three major organs, the pituitary, the thyroid and the adrenals. So just maybe on pituitary three, and thyroid three, something like that. Mainly, we need to know what to order and how to interpret this. First is, I would like everyone, whenever the MR images come, just look into it once before going into the report or after the report also. Just keep in touch with the T1, T2 and the sequences. So, you get acquainted to it. That is my first point. Second is, thyroid is always ultrasound and never a CT because you don't want to radiate it. Thyroid. About the pituitary, MRI is the best one. MRI is the best, ovaries, ultrasounds are the best, pancreas, I have said multiple times today itself, that CT is the best. I okay. think the other big thing which often happens in terms of ovarian imaging is that we are often labeled as PCOS. So what is your take about that? Uh, what are really the criteria we should take in terms of PCOS and the significance of that? We always mention PCOS, PCOS like uh, ovaries. Yes. We don't use the word PCOD as such. Yes. PCOS are bulky kidneys with peripherally arranged follicles and a ecogenic stroma. The center part is ecogenic and peripherally arranged follicles, which is larger in size. That's it. I think that's a very important message because radiologists always write PCOS like appearance. So PCOA. And we clinicians often make it like PCOD. They are not saying this is PCOS. So remember in adolescence particularly, this PCOA appearance is of no consequence. Basically, we have to look at clinical features, hyperandrogenism, anovulation, and this feature will be of least significance. And that's very, very important to understand in that perspective. The other... Yes, I think volume, volume of course... Are important, hmm. but uh, more than 15, 15 cc are usually con uh, considered as a large for the China. Yeah. And I think one very, very important reason that we do uh, the sort of uh, evaluation is in terms of the precocious puberty. Yes. So we look for basically the uterus and the other factors. So how do you really guide when you think that the puberty is happening and this sort of thing in the uterus shape, the size, what is the, your guide? The, uh, size of the uterus, the endometrial thickness, the on the and if the follicles are dominant or not, or they have ruptured or not, that's best. I think that's very important. So we always look at if the size, the shape has become from tubular to more globular structure, 
whether you've got an endometrial stripe, as Dr. Thakit has said, and whether your length is more than 32 mm. So I think these criteria will become very, very important. This was a very, very uh, intriguing and a very, very difficult session because especially since you came running from the <laughs> hospital, I'm sure you would have done a lot of interventions today. So this was a very good intervention on our part. Hopefully we are all more learned uh, on that. If there are any questions, we can take them. Yes, please. Mike. Uh, doing USG neck, can we also see uh, parathyroid glands? Parathyroid glands, until uh, unless bulky, we are not able to see them. Only when they are bulky, they are seen them. Many of the times, even we report parathyroid gland and they turn out to be lymph nodes in those locations. Even I do can confuse with them. Okay, so you. for parathyroid gland, then probably the best would be to go for a scan. scan the yeah. nuclear scan will always be better, especially the sesame B scan will be better. Now, one case which we actually discussed with you also was the pancreatic lesion. So not in terms of the pancreatitis or anything. Sometimes we have hyperinsulinism in which you have a very small lesion. We know that PET is better, but if you want to do CT or this thing, which one will I'll be better? for triple phase CT. Triple, triple phase, phase CT. CT. Pancreas is CT and we go for a triple phase CT. Some of, I've got a, I've published a paper on uh, multiple insulinomas, the multiple insulinomas in that patient. Some of the lesions got enhanced in the arterial phase. When you say a triple phase, it is in the arterial phase. Then again, the CT is repeated in the portal phase and then in the venous phase. So some of the insulomas get enhancement, uh, get enhanced on arterial phase, some on portal phase and some on venous phase. As we had around 8 or 10 uh, insulinomas in that particular case and everyone was enhancing in a different phase. So right. whenever you order for suspecting an insulinoma, go for a triphasic CT. I think that's a very important uh, thing that you discussed. Another case in which, which is rare, but uh, maybe the audience would be interested would be ectopic Cushing's. So we have got a very high level of ACTH. The MRI pituitary is normal. We want to localize the most common cause in children will be like carcinoids, especially the bronchial carcinoid and that. And we know the diagnostic accuracy of uh, these imaging may not be very good. Yeah. But what will be the best recommendation you will give Dr. Saket for the identification of carcinoid lesions? In I this think situation? CT scan would be the best one. CT scan, CT scan of the, the chest and medias channel yeah. basically yeah. will be the, the one. Of the best one. MRI in the chest, in the mediastinum is good, but because of the respiratory movements, the images are not that clear always. So I think uh, with, yes, Dr. Vasanth. Yeah. That uh, we just saw one uh, M uh, MRI in that it was, uh, he, he just told about, uh, it was a case of MPHD and uh, it was shown as uh, empty cella. But yep. I, according to me, I think M, uh, MPHD, every case will not have empty cella. And empty cella also is not vice versa. Yeah, so it yeah. have many yeah. things. Yes, but MPHD, I think there are many presentations. Yes, so yes, not yes. always. You, don't have always so you can have a tumor. You can yes. have a stock uh, thickening. You can have an infiltrative disorder. So but yes, empty cella can have MPHD, definitely. It is that, but this is not that. No, no, no. no. no they are two different things. So this is a cause. So it depends. This is one of the causes. Yes. One of the causes. And all empty cellars don't present will with this. not. Way. Because yes. in adults, many times empty cellar, they yes. think that it is normal. They yeah, just, it will depend upon most of the empty cellars are normal. Normal. <laughs> that is the thing. That's why I thought MPHD, when we think it's a big thing. An empty cellar, then no, no, you normal. have to work up. So if you have empty cellar, even if you are saying that it is normal, you should do a baseline endocrine workup before you say that it's normal. Because what is empty cellar? It means that your pituitary was damaged and it's fueled by fluid. Even if you have 1 to 5% pituitary functioning, it may be normal. But suppose 100% is damaged, you will have MPHD in that setting. So we routinely get a lot of referrals from neurologists with this empty cellar. And I would say 5 to 10% will have actually a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. So this is something which I is there. Think, uh, that's yeah. only I wanted so to that mention. Is the thing. And I think the Thank last you. point would be regarding the incidental lesions. So we are seeing a lot of incidental lomas, particularly in the pituitary and the adrenals. So what is your take about them? Like, uh, how do we really, we know about the diagnostic workup from an endocrine perspective. MRI, from, in both the conditions, MRI would be the best one. MRI would be the best one to do the further workup yeah. in that perspective. So I think it was a wonderful question to take. Dr. Alka has, I think, the last question here.
thyroid uh, regarding malignancy we do elastography i don't elastography is an ultrasound itself my on to like based on the ultrasound we can define uh, by and large we can define whether the uh, lesion is benign or the malignant is there any added benefit of doing elastography in patient with thyroid nodules yeah thyroid nodule uh, no, it's not always that we are able to differentiate between benign and uh, the uh, benign and malignant we do have to do many time we have to do an fnc to diagnose it's as a benign or a malignant any added benefit yeah. of doing elastography elastography is helpful it says about the thickness the density of the lesion elastic elasticity of the lesion it is done in only two condition one is breast breast tumors and the thyroid nodules so if a, in a malignancy you find it to be less elastic so it will become so more it uh, is more rigid. rigid yeah it is more rigid so and anyways we have got a very specific thyroid scoring system yes. which is there based upon the guidelines are there that when you should do an fnac so now we are more proactive in terms of fnac but one message is that whenever you are doing a fnac thyroid in a child it should always be ultrasound guided yes. i think now you routinely you do all yes. of them are ultrasound guided but definitely for children you should definitely have a ultrasound guided uh, fnac So I think this was a wonderful session. I like to thank uh, Dr. Vikas. Your last question. Dr. Sake Singh, just few comments on adrenal imaging, please. Adrenal imaging. Uh -huh. Few MRI is the best modality. Uh, in every case, you or you start with sonography and then go for MRI. No, sonography will definitely give. It's an easy one. You can give you a suspicion if there is a mass or not. If they characterize a mass, MR would be the best one. And Looking into a mass, ultrasound is good. and to characterize the mass mri is the best so screening you can use at the hound and then follow up by, yeah. by mri but yeah. i'll give you a warning that i have seen patients with precocious puberty particularly boys in which ultrasound was normal ha, and then I'm ct ha. and other things picked up yeah. so we have to be very cautious that's when you why, have a small lesion that's why yeah so generally you can do ultrasound as a screening it's easily available one, yeah. but it's also operator dependent so how well the operator is so we will be confident doing here but otherwise if i am really worried about a carcinoma i'll do a ct also and mri from that mri as i dr sakit said is the best modality on that regards